U.S. intelligence agencies have returned to investigate one of the most famous crimes in U.S. history, the famous Edgar Hoover, who headed the FBI for almost half a century, probably regretted that he could not catch a certain Dan Cooper. However, why son? Thanks to his elusiveness and audacity, Cooper became a famous character in American folklore. Songs were written about him, Chuck Brodsky's The Ballad of Cooper, books were written and films were made, Hunting for Cooper, in which the main character was played by Treat Williams. Why folklore and not real history? Because no one still knows who he is, what his real name is, and what happened to him after he committed the crime that made him famous. The hijacking of Northwest Airlines, NWA, Flight 305 is still the only unsolved aerial robbery in history. Now, 36 years later, the FBI has reopened its investigation into the famous crime. Agent Larry Carr, who was only four years old in 1971, is in charge of the new investigation. This story began at an airport in Portland, Oregon, around 4 p.m. On November 24, 1971, a man in his 40s wearing a fedora, black coat, black suit, and thin black tie walked up to the Northwest Airlines counter and asked for a ticket to Seattle. There were few passengers that day. The Boeing 727-100 to with a capacity of 94 people was no more than a third full. Perhaps that is why the NWA ticket salesman remembered the customer who identified himself as Dan Cooper. He had slightly protruding ears, thin lips, brown eyes, a broad forehead, and thinning hair. He held a black case in his hands, paying $18.52. Dan Cooper got a ticket to seat 18C on flight 305, which was scheduled to land at Seattle-Tacoma International Airport half an hour after takeoff, and hurried to the landing. Cooper took his seat in the last row and ordered a bourbon and soda before the flight even started. When 23-year-old flight attendant Florence Schaffner placed a glass on his table, he handed her a note. She sighed and slipped it into her pocket. Sure it was a phone number. Flo was accustomed to the attentions of single passengers, but the man in seat 18C said in a low voice, Better read it, miss. Schaffner looked into his eyes and realized that he was not joking. I have a bomb in my briefcase, the note said in block letters. If necessary, I am ready to blow it up. I want you to sit next to me. This is a robbery. The stewardess took a seat next to her as Dan Cooper began listing his demands. In Seattle, he should be given $200,000 in $20 bills and four parachutes, two main ones that are hung on his back and two spare ones, and refuel the plane. Florence passed the demands on to the captain of the crew, William Scott. He, after several calls, received an order to carry out all the orders of the hijacker and took to the air. When Schaffner returned to the back of the salon, Cooper put on black glasses. She, as ordered by the captain, asked him to show the bomb. He opened the case a little so that she could see at least two red cylinders that looked like sticks of dynamite, a tangle of wires, and a battery. The last doubts that Mr. Cooper was not joking disappeared. Cooper ordered the pilot to circle over Seattle until word was received from the ground that the money and parachutes were ready. So 727 landed in Tacoma half an hour later than scheduled. He was driven to the very corner of the runway. The money and parachutes were handed over through flight attendants, Florence Schaffner, and Tina Macklow. The FBI agents did not label the bills, but the serial numbers of all bills began with the letter L. They were printed in 1969 by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and were photographed every single one. Convinced that everything was in order with the money and parachutes, Cooper released all 36 passengers and Florence Schaffner, on board, besides him, remained the stewardess Tina Macklow, Captain Scott, his assistant, and navigator. While the plane was being refueled, the hijacker, through the stewardess, conveyed the next requirements to the crew. They were supposed to fly to Mexico City at an altitude of no more than 3,000 meters. He warned that he had a handheld altimeter, a speed of 320 kilometers slash h and keep the flaps at an angle of 15 degrees. Having learned that even with full tanks, a Boeing at such a speed and height would be able to fly no more than half the way, he decided to land in Reno, Nevada, for another refueling. At 19.40 the plane took off again. Cooper told Tina Macklow to go to the cockpit. Soon, a light on the instrument panel flashed, indicating the opening of the rear ladder, the pressure in the cabin has clearly changed. Scott wasn't surprised. The flight attendants noticed that while refueling, Cooper carefully read the instructions for using this exit. If we assume that the rubber jumped from the plane immediately after the opening of the exit, then this happened at 20, 13. However, there was no absolute certainty about this, because he strictly forbade anyone to leave the cabin. The Boeing 727-100 landed in Reno with the air stairs down at 10.15 p.m. After waiting five minutes, Scott asked Cooper on the intercom what to do next, and, 
Having received no answer, carefully looked into the salon, the robber disappeared, taking with him most of his belongings, clothes, a bag with money weighing 9.5 kilograms, which he tied to his waist with cut-off straps from one of the parachutes, and a briefcase with a bomb. More than a man known as Dan Cooper, no one saw. FBI agents carefully searched the plane. They did not have samples of Cooper's handwriting, because he prudently demanded the return of the note. In the cabin, 66 fingerprints were found that did not belong to passengers and crew members. And yet the criminal made one mistake. For unknown reasons, he left a mother of pearl clip tie and eight Raleigh cigarette butts on the plane. Where and how Cooper left the plane is not known exactly. The two F-106s escorted from the nearby Makrod Air Force Base were ill-equipped to monitor the aircraft at snail's speed and low altitude. The pilots did not notice the parachutist. By the time the more adapted Lockheed T-33 of the National Guard arrived, it was already too late. FBI agents checked the criminal database in case Cooper was so reckless that he gave his real name when buying a ticket. Alas, their hopes were not justified. The search for the fugitive began the next day. In addition to the FBI agents, more than 400 soldiers from the military base participated in them. The costly operation, which lasted several weeks, ended in failure. No trace of the robber was found. But to accuse the FBI of unprofessionalism somehow does not turn the tongue. The task before them was too difficult. The area where Dan Cooper allegedly jumped is one of the wildest in the United States. Below are dense forests with 45-meter spruces and pines, lakes with waterfalls, mountains covered with snow and ice and deep gorges in which bears and cougars live. In addition, despite the low speed of the 727, it was difficult to determine the exact place of the jump. Even an experiment did not help, during which a load of 90 kilograms was dropped from an aircraft under similar conditions. In the end, the robber's landing point was determined somewhere in the area of backslash U-200B backslash U-200B town of Ariel, near Lake Mervyn, 30 kilometers north of Portland. But the search turned out to be fruitless. One of the FBI agents was assigned to check all the Portland Dan Coopers. Joe Frazier, a local reporter, learned from one of his informants at the police department that the agent was looking into the Dan B. Cooper case. And although Portland Cooper was quickly deleted from the list of suspects, the name of the criminal was fixed. He is still called D. B. Cooper today. In the 36 years that have passed since that November day, FBI agents have done a gigantic job. They checked and interrogated more than a thousand suspects. Several of them were checked by the Bureau, so to speak, in full. Of course, there were some clues. Cooper did not look like a simple criminal. The flight attendants claimed that he behaved very politely with them and even wanted to pay for the drug bourbon. During a two-hour layover in Seattle, he allowed the crew members to have dinner. At first, FBI agents believed that Cooper, given his behavior and demands, understood parachutes and airplanes. From his remarks, it could be assumed that he was quite familiar with the area. The first suspect was Richard McCoy, a former Utah Sunday school teacher who flew helicopters and skydived in Vietnam. For months after the NWA robbery, on April 7, 1972, he committed a similar crime. He hijacked a United Airlines Boeing 727 to 100, but jumped from a plane flying over Utah, not with $200,000, but with half a million. He also demanded four parachutes. True, unlike Cooper, the imitator inherited. He left a note on the plane with a sample of his handwriting and a magazine with fingerprints. And McCoy let down a long tongue. He was turned in by a friend, a patrol cop, who he told after the NWA robbery that Cooper should have demanded $500,000. McCoy was detained two days after the crime, on April 9. Ironically, as a member of the National Guard, at the time of his arrest, he helped look for the raider, that is, himself, and circled in a helicopter over the forests. During the search, they found a paratrooper suit and a bag with $499,970. And although McCoy claimed to be innocent, fingerprint and handwriting examinations incontrovertibly proved his guilt. Richard McCoy received 45 years in prison. Two years later, he escaped using a mock gun he made from plaster stolen from a prison dentist. In a shootout with the police, McCoy was killed. The FBI removed him from the list of suspects in the NWA robbery because on Thanksgiving November 25th, 1971, he was sitting at home at the festive table with his wife and two children, supporters of the version that McCoy was Cooper, among them FBI agent Russell Callum and former parole officer Bernie Rhodes, authors of the book Cooper, The Real McCoy, referred to the words of relatives of Richard McCoy, who claimed that Cooper left on on the plane, the mother of Pearl Clip belonged to him. However, Richard McCoy was not the only copycat of Cooper. 
In 1972 alone, two more people attempted similar mid-air heists. After that, the Federal Aviation Administration required that the Boeing 727, the only aircraft model with a rear air stair, be equipped with a mechanical aerodynamic device that did not allow the air stair to be lowered during flight. And other security measures at airports and on airplanes were taken precisely after the robbery Dan Cooper. By the way, it is possible that Cooper himself was an imitator. Two weeks before the NWA heist, one Paul Cheney, an Air Canada flight passenger, brandished a gun somewhere over Montana and demanded money in a parachute. He was pinned down by the crew and, putting on a parachute, he lost his vigilance for a second and lowered his pistol. The press played a significant role in the NWA robbery investigation. In July 2000, U.S. News & World Report published an article about Joe Weber, a widow from the Florida town of Pace. She claimed that Dan Cooper was her late husband Wayne Weber, an antique dealer who allegedly confessed this to her days before his death from kidney cancer on March 28, 1995. The widow wanted to figure everything out and began to check the life of her late husband. Joe remembered that Dwayne once had a nightmare in which he said something about jumping from a plane and about fingerprints on the back stairs. Shortly before his death, Weber told his wife that the knee injury that bothered him for many years, he received as a result of jumping from an airplane. Weber was born in 1924 and served in World War II. Later he was in prison, located near the Portland airport. In the summer of 1979, the Webbers went on vacation to Seattle. During this sentimental, according to Dwayne Weber, journey, he drove his wife to the banks of the Columbia River, which flows a few kilometers from Vancouver. In the same place on February 10, 1980, eight-year-old Brian Ingram, who came to a picnic with his parents, found 5,800 half-rotten dollars buried in twenties, the serial numbers of which coincided with the numbers of the money received by Cooper. It was the only money from that ransom that surfaced in a third of a century. Joe Weber went to the local library, picked up a book about Cooper, and saw her husband's handwritten notes in the margin. Then she wrote to Ralph Himmelsbach, the FBI's special agent who had led the search for Cooper for eight years. According to Himmelsbach, Weber is the best suspect the Bureau has ever seen. And while the comparison of Weber's shots with Cooper's identikit did not give a clear answer, a recent computer comparison of images of 3,000 people, including Dwayne Weber, with the identikit showed that Weber resembles him more than the rest. And yet the FBI believes that Dwayne Weber could not be Dan Cooper. His fingerprints did not match any of the prints found on the plane. And besides, the DNA samples obtained from the tie left on the plane do not match Weber's DNA. The last and most likely candidate for the role of Cooper was covered by New York Magazine in its October issue last year. And although the FBI does not agree with the arguments of the author of the article, reporter Jeffrey Gray, for some reason, it was after its publication that the Bureau posted previously classified information on the case on its website. One evening a few years ago, Lyle Christensen, 77, a former postal worker who lives with his wife in Morris, Minnesota, was flipping through the TV channels and got on the program Unsolved Crimes, one of the episodes of which was devoted to the Cooper case. He froze as if rooted to the spot when he saw the identikit of the robber. Cooper was like two drops of water similar to his older brother Kenny. Christensen wrote several times to the FBI about his suspicions to no avail, then tried to contact Nord Efren, who wrote the script for the film he liked Sleepless in Seattle, but received no answer. And only in the New York private detective agency Sherlock Investigations, where he asked to personally deliver the letter to Efron, his suspicions were treated with due attention. Lyle began emailing Skip Ports, director of Sherlock Investigations. The detective's last doubts about Lyle's version disappeared after he sent him pictures of his older brother. Kenneth Peter Christensen was born October 17, 1926 and died July 30, 1994 from cancer. He lived in his own house in Bonnie Lake, Washington. Kenneth Christensen came to the recruiting office in 1944. For several months he was preparing to become a paratrooper, but he did not take part in the hostilities. Japan had capitulated by the time he was released from the training camp, about a year after the NWA robbery, in October 1972. Kenny bought a house in Bonnie Lake, a small town in the Cascade Mountains, for $14,000 in cash, and a year later paid, according to the bill of sale, another $1,500 for a piece of land. Before retiring, he worked for the NWA as a steward. Despite a beggarly salary at NWA, one of America's most stingy airlines, Christensen had plenty of money, and he always treated friends and guests. Kenny's favorite liquor was bourbon, which he collected, and cigarettes were Raleigh. Lyle also explained quite logically why Dan Cooper, if he, of course, was his brother Kenny, demanded a ransom in twenties. 
and not in denominations of other denominations. Even in early childhood, during the years of the Great Depression, his father took him and Kenny to the fair and there, having won in the boxing ring, he earned $100, huge money in those difficult and hungry times. The prize was given out in five $20 bills. That money he and his brother, according to Lyle, remembered for a lifetime. A few days before his death, Kenny asked his younger brother to move closer to the bed. I have to tell you something from my past, he whispered, but I can't do it. Now Lyle is sure that the older brother was talking about the NWA robbery. Jeffrey Gray carried pictures of Kenneth Christensen to Florence Schaffner, the only survivor of the robbery. The robbery was a very strong blow for Flo, from which she was never able to recover. She quit her job and returned to her parents. Schaffner's hands still shake when she talks about Cooper. If he was alive, she reasoned trembling with fear. He would definitely try to kill her as an unnecessary witness. For many years, before getting behind the wheel, she always looked under the car in search of a bomb. FBI agents showed Florence Schaffner photographs of dozens of suspects, but Kenny Christensen, she claims, looks like Cooper the most. Ralph Immelsbach, who is already retired, also agrees with her. After seeing pictures of Kenny, he said that he would have made him the prime suspect if he had run the case. But Larry Carr, the same agent who is now instructed to return to the Cooper case, does not agree with his former colleague. In his opinion, Kenneth Christensen is shorter and lighter than Dan Cooper, he has a different eye color and different hair. Christensen was not supposed to rob the plane of the company he worked for, not for patriotic reasons, but for fear that someone would recognize him. In general, the most common assumption in the FBI, and Carr supports it, is that Cooper died in the jump. The version that he was an experienced skydiver was eventually abandoned by the FBI. An experienced skydiver would not jump from an airplane in such weather, a strong wind blew that evening. The robber did not agree on the flight route. The plane was simply moving towards Reno. But Carr's main argument is that Cooper didn't seem to have checked his parachutes before jumping, which an experienced jumper would have done. One of the reserve parachutes that they brought him accidentally turned out to be a demonstration parachute. I. E. Wired. He could not use it for its intended purpose. And it was his robber who took with him, leaving a working parachute in the plane.